So a couple weeks ago, we went to Micro Center to pick up parts and stuff for my daughter's build. If you guys haven't seen that video, make sure you go and check it out because it turned out great and I wish I kept it and no kid needs a powerful computer like that, which is why it's awesome. But we realized something when we were there. There might be more people buying and upgrading computers today than I think I've ever seen in the last eight years of running this channel. It has been, wait, what's today's date? Oh, it's the 28th. My eight year anniversary was two days ago. I missed it. Today we're gonna to talk about things you should never do to your computer. NZXT's starter PC series now starts at $699 and gives you everything you need to get into the world of PC. Available in multiple configurations, the starter PC can be tailored to meet your budget and needs and are the perfect way to build a work or learn from home setup while still being capable of 1080p 60fps gaming and popular titles like Fortnite, Rainbow Six Siege, and League of Legends. All of NZXT PCs come back with a two-year warranty on parts, labor, and RAM overclocking helping to guarantee the best gaming possible for your build. To see the full list of specs and pricing on the NZXT Starter PC series, click the link in the description below. So these are not in any sort of particular order, they're just things I've kind of accumulated over the, my, I'm building computers now since I was five. I don't know how much that counts. I put together a computer when I was five. When I was about the age of 10, I truly started building computers for like my, parent, my dad's company and stuff like that. Um, so I've got nearly 30 years experience of building computers. Wow, I'm old. Okay, anyway, moving on. Um, so <laughs> I just figured with the amount of people that are probably building a computer for the first time, getting ready for some major title releases later, later this year, we know Cyberpunk is gonna bring a lot of people to PC. We know Fall Guys has brought a lot of people to PC because you can run it on a potato. Not to mention the people look like potatoes in Fall Guy, but that's fine. I figured I would just kind of prepare you guys for some things that maybe you should not do to your computer. So here's one I'm gonna start off with that I think is fairly obvious, but I don't think a lot of people really think about this. And that is don't set your computer on carpet. Now I know a lot of people are gonna be like, why? What the heck? Okay, <clears throat> most of the time you're gonna find people installing power supplies with the fan face down. That way it can get its own fresh air supply and then it exhausts it out the back. So it really doesn't depend on the case to supply air to it. But not all cases have a big enough foot system, if you will, or any sort of a riser system built in. Some have really decent amounts of rise built into the bottom of the case. The Lee and Lee dynamic, uh, O11 dynamic is actually one of them. A lot of times you're, you're dealing with maybe a half inch, maybe 12, 13 millimeters of height. And that's not a lot of room if you think about carpet. Now, I know a lot of Europeans right now are probably watching this going, carpet? Who puts a computer on carpet? Who has carpet, right? Because I guess carpet's really more of a, a North America thing. I don't know if that's true, but a lot of people I, I've always seen in Europe be like, why is there so much carpet in American homes? Well, that, regardless, that's the, the fact. And if you set a computer down on carpet and you start to plug up those holes with that carpet, if you have plush carpet especially, not like office carpet where it's real thin, but like the thicker stuff, then you'll find that it'll plug up that hole a little bit. You're gonna have a lot less reduced airflow to your power supply, but more importantly than that, it's gonna be, carpet is where dust and dirt and pet hair and dander and all that stuff just, and dandruff probably, is where that stuff just accumulates. And if it's picking it up off of those intake fans on the bottom or your power supply, then it's gonna be circulating that into your system. So what I highly recommend, and you can do this for really cheap, and I will put a link to the, the stuff I'm gonna recommend in any of these videos in the description because I always get people like, where do I buy this stuff? Um, I recommend getting yourself just a small piece of wood you can go down to your hardware store and you can find those pre-made shelves which are already like white, brown, wood tone, and they're all like laminate and stuff. And put one of those on the floor and set your computer on that. That's the super basic way to do it. And what's gonna happen here is you're gonna give your computer a nice solid surface to sit on. You're gonna create a barrier between a lot of that dust and dirt so it can't be picked up into your system. And it's just gonna be overall more friendly to the airflow and actually the stability of your system sitting on something solid. Now, if you wanna make it prettier, you can make it a pedestal by going onto Amazon and buying some furniture feet. You can get them in only a couple inches all the way up to like, I think eight inch tall furniture feet, uh, like you'd find on the bottom of like chairs and stuff. And you can make a little pedestal to get it even farther up off the ground. And the farther away from the ground it is, the less likely it'll be for the intake fans on the front to also pick up dirt off of the floor. Remember, as dust and dirt falls out of the sky, it settles down low. And that, if your computer's down low, that's where most of it is gonna accumulate and it's gonna be sucked into your system and make, just make it a kind of a cleanliness nightmare. So that's one I would definitely not do to your system if you care about it. Now something else we've also seen is a uh, very trendy design in cases these days is tempered glass side panels. If we go back, geez, probably only five years or so, 
you'd find that there were a lot more solid side panels or plexiglass panels, but a lot of them had ventilation built into them. Perforations, honeycomb, or even fan mounts on the side to allow direct air to blow right onto your graphics card. Now that's great for cooling, not great for aesthetics. And it seems like there's been this, this design trend over the last few years where aesthetics seems to reign supreme over function. And what's happening now is you're seeing a lot of companies now integrating vertical mounts for your graphics cards into these cases. Now vertical mount itself is not a problem. In fact, there's a lot of data that supports having a GPU vertically mounted can actually improve its cooling capability. And the reason for that is if you have fans pointing down that are pulling air up into the graphics card, that air has then got to go through the fins and make kind of a turn, bounce off the sidewall, and then go out the top of your case or the back of your case. And if you vertically mount it, heat rises. And not only that, you're not going to be having the bottom of the graphics card, which has also got air coming out of it, sitting against the motherboard, blowing heat down onto the motherboard. So you can actually get that heat away from the motherboard and use a natural convection of heat, plus the fans pushing air through the fins, allowing a more efficient rise of heat, more efficient airflow through the graphics card. The problem is, many of these manufacturers set that graphics card far too close to the glass side panel, or the plexi side panel, or whatever type of side panel it might be. Then what you're getting is, instead of having a nice giant cushion of air underneath the graphics card feeding it, you're gonna have a very thin slot of air between the fans and the glass or the side panel, choking it off, giving you the opposite effect of causing inadequate or inefficient cooling to your graphics card. Now back in the day, you couldn't even put a three slot card, which is very common and looks like it's going to be very common in the next launch of graphics cards, uh, up against a uh, vertical mount because they were only supporting two slot. But now you have a lot of cases supporting three slot, which is gonna make the problem even worse if it's too close to the glass panel. Now I would recommend having at least an inch or about 24 millimeters of space between the face of the, your card and the panel to make sure that you have adequate airflow. If that's the case, then you're fine. If that's the case, get it? If that's the case, okay, whatever. Um, I find it's fine as long as you have that much airflow, but I'm not kidding when I say some of these vertical mounts in these cases do literally put the face of the card practically touching the glass side panel. Now the easiest way to determine whether or not you would have a problem with airflow is to just look at your case. If it doesn't require one of those conversion plates to, to basically rotate the, where the GPU would mount, and it's got some that are already basically built into the case, you can see what that gap is gonna be from the, the most outward slot to the side panel. And you can just kind of take a measurement there. And if it looks like you have plenty of room at that point, then go for it. Now to go vertical mount though, some cost is usually involved with needing a riser card. So if you already have the stuff you need to do a vertical mount, just try it. If your temps suffer, just put it back. It's not, it's not a good idea to choose aesthetics and looking at the face of your graphics card and putting that ahead of, of actual performance and temperature. Because we all know high temperatures over time is also what can degrade your hardware, leading to instability, crashes, and just overall death. Yeah, just try it. You could die. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst I could have? If you died, it was a bad idea. Yeah. So while we're on the subject of cases, why don't we go and talk about the worst thing you could do for your computer being not researching the case before you buy it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of monkey see, monkey do in this industry. And as computers have become way more popular, remember, we are literally, I think, at the pinnacle of PC gaming, live streaming, and, and all of that. It is, it is, it is a massive, multi-billion dollar industry right now. As you've got more people that are becoming famous on Twitch and on YouTube, everyone wants to be like everyone else, and uh, I, wanna, I want to game, I want to do this, I want to live stream. We have so many people buying and building computers today, it's insane. And like I said, what we saw at Micro Center just a couple weeks ago really shocked me because I've been shopping Micro Center for 15 years and I've never seen it look like it does today. Things are out of stock. They're selling hundreds of CPUs per day. It is absolutely bonkers as to what's going on. So what'll happen is you'll get these companies that will make a case that looks like a famous case or a popular case or one that's just trendy and they won't actually put the same level of engineering into it as the brand that they're knocking off. Now that's true for pretty much every industry. I mean, every industry has its knockoffs. But with cases, it can literally lead to a less than desirable and or worse performing system than you anticipated because of airflow issues. Now, a real common trend right now is to have solid front panels, whether it be solid steel, solid glass, just aesthetic, doesn't matter. Now, that's not a problem as long as where the front fans pick up air 
is well thought out. Whether it be giant openings on the bottom, perforations on the side, proper airflow testing is done to find the right balance between aesthetics and performance because no, no front solid panel case is gonna perform like a mesh case. No matter how much you try, it's not gonna happen. Now I know people like Steve at Gamers Nexus, Hardware Canucks, they've done a lot of, of chassis testing. They're like, they're, they are the kings in that space when it comes to just those types of reviews. And to be honest, we don't go to that level of degree where we're like, this case is 0.2 degrees Celsius hotter than this case at normalized fan volume. We don't do any of that crap around here. We are the, we are, no, I'm serious. We are the, Phil's laughing back there because I said we don't do that crap. Now it's not crap, it's just, we are the average consumer type of reviewer. We bought this case, we put these parts in, we played these games, this was the temp we got. If you're okay with that, buy it. If not, go somewhere else. That's literally the way we, we approach things. It works for me, it's the way I shop, it's the way I share. But what you're gonna find is that sometimes you can have a case that looks the part, but will literally thermal throttle your hardware, your graphics cards, your CPUs, heck, even your SSDs if you've got one of these guys, the fiery RGBs. So do your research before you buy your case. Don't just buy your case based on that one's pretty because sometimes you're gonna find that one's pretty hot, <laughs> that one's pretty bad. There's always some sort of a descriptor after the pretty. <laughs> pretty itself isn't at that point a descriptor, it's more of a measurement of the word after it, which then becomes this was pretty much a waste of money and it's happened. And unfortunately it happens all the time now that you've got too many people out there copying each other and not doing the same due diligence in engineering, which is why we always support the brand that engineers, not the brand that copies. Now, sometimes the worst thing you could do for your computer has nothing to do with the hardware at all. It's about your software. And Windows 10 was designed to be an ultra lightweight OS to run on tablets and, and back when Microsoft was really trying to compete with the iPad, with, you know, lightweight can run on a potato and that's fine. It means it's gonna make everyone's computer faster. But over the years, Microsoft being Microsoft lost its way and has bloated the crap out of it. And so now you have find a situation where um, you can, through your OS alone, really kill your, your overall PC experience. Now we found a great tool to use called Windows 10 Deep D Bloater, not Deep Loader, D Bloater, like just gets rid of all the bloatware on your system. Now we're not gonna do a tutorial on how to use it. You can screw some things up by like making Windows Store not work again, but it's worth checking out. It's very easy to use. It's got uh, you know a, a GUI on there where you can select what stuff to uninstall, how to reinstall the stuff too if you screw something up. But the reason why I'm even bringing this up is Windows Defender is good for probably 90 to 95% of the stuff out there that you would could potentially get uh, infections from. But long gone are the days of free antiviral, antiviral? Antiviruses, yeah. antiviri? Where they actually did something good for your computer. Now what they tend to do is simply slow it down. They run constant scans trying to slow your computer down, making you think you need to buy the premium versions to get your computer you know, running right, when all it's gonna do is basically put it back to where it was. Virus definitions are constantly updated on Windows Defender. We've not had any problems on our systems uh, by not running any of those third-party antivirus software. Now there are good antivirus softwares out there. Don't, don't get me wrong on that. I'm not saying that it's not a necessary thing. But you know what I've seen in the past, and I'm gonna use my, my late father as an example. He would tell me, my computer's running slow. I don't know what's happening. I click on something and it won't load or it's just ridiculously slow. And I'll go in there and he'll have like two different registry like cleaning software going. He'll have like two different virus softwares running. And then he'll have like this other like Windows, def not Windows Defender, but like an online Defender program that's like sniffing all the packets as they come and go and just, because every time something didn't work, he tried another one, but never took off the other one. So it would stack and then they would conflict and they would fight each other for control of the system. And it doesn't take much to saturate your, your storage when you're constantly scanning like that. Con so it's one of those things where I think less is more when it comes to your operating system. If you're not going to sites uh, that, are, that are sketchy, if you use some common sense about inspecting an element before you click on it, and seeing where it's gonna take you and it's not a spoofed link or a, you know, some sort of a, a redirect, you'd find that your system will run a lot better without loading any of that crap on it. And then getting rid of all the crap that already comes on it by using Windows 10 D Bloater. Now we're gonna move back to hardware here because that's what I know and do. Phil's the software guy, you can talk about software. Um, don't mismatch your hardware. It's easy to get caught up in bundle deals. 
And do you know what a lot of these people will do when it comes to bundle deals? And by bundle, bundle deals, I mean a lot of these online retailers and stuff. Micro Center is actually pretty good about not doing what I'm about to say. That is making these combo deals with stuff that doesn't move or sell. You'll find them taking high-end overclocking motherboards because they're too expensive sometimes and they don't move, like they don't move that often. And they'll give you like a stupid amount off and pair it with a locked CPU. Now this really only applies to Intel, honestly, because every AMD CPU is unlocked. But Intel will have their unlocked SKUs and their, over, you know, their overclocking SKUs and then their non-overclocking SKUs. And you'll find this real bad pairing where you'll have this really overkill motherboard that a really underwhelming CPU put together because they're trying to move products and that's how they come up with a lot of these bundle deals. Or what they'll do is they'll, they'll start to pair it with RAM that's just not good for the combo. Like let's say taking a 10900K and then pairing it with like a 2400 megahertz stick of RAM or two sticks of RAM or whatever it is. The worst thing you can honestly do is not do due diligence when it comes to preparing for the parts. It is easy to accidentally leave some money on the table or put money into the wrong component. If you have $1,000 to spend on your main components, it's easy to be like, okay, I'm gonna spend 500 on the graphics card, I'm gonna send, spend 300 on the CPU, and I'm gonna spend $79 on the motherboard. Giving you the opposite situation, where you have an overclocking CPU and a bare bones, low end chipset, non overclocking, non Japanese solid capacitor, non robust VRM delivery system, meaning that you can't take any advantage of the features of the CPU you just bought because the motherboard doesn't allow it because it's locked. The motherboard itself being locked and that you can't do anything with it because of the fact that it's not designed to handle it. And heaven forbid, the motherboard manufacturer BIOS does allow it and you physically cause damage. We're talking about uh, swelling and exploding capacitors. We're talking about VRMs literally catching on fire because of the fact that you were allowed to overclock something that this power delivery wasn't capable of handling. I think that that's probably the worst thing you could do for your computer. It's, 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 I guess an analogy would be something along the lines of putting an undersized fuel system in a race engine kind of a deal, right? Where you're gonna start having massive engine destruction because of a fuel mixture being off. And you really wanna keep that mixture of your components balanced. It's easy to get caught up and, and overspend here and underspend there. And it's confusing for a lot of new people. I understand that, trust me, as someone that still every now and then has to do my own research on, wait a minute, what exactly am I leaving on the table with this and that? There are so many parts and so many SKUs now. Do you remember when, Phil, I'm talking to you directly now, back when you might have one or two motherboard options per chipset, a high end and a mid range, and then maybe a third, like a low end entry level, and that was it. Remember how Asus used to be like, blue is the mainstream and red was the gaming and then like yellow or whatever other color was the overclocking it was literally color coded yeah. so you knew what you were getting again the popularity of pcs being what they are you now have motherboards on launch day that will have like 17 motherboard SKUs. i mean how many times have i been like was this the rg strix 37 maximus formula gene 3 or whatever <laughs> and you're like no no it's the gene 2. Oh, okay cool or, or you'll have a wi-fi version and a non-wi-fi version where the only difference is they stripped wi-fi out of one you know <laughs> And you, and, you, and you needed Wi-Fi and you like didn't catch it. So I think the worst thing you could possibly do is just not do your research. It's confusing, but trust me, nothing sucks more than getting the wrong parts, exchanging them and finding out there's a restocking fee on almost everything electronic these days. At least here in the United States. I don't, I don't know about other places, but a lot of places, if you go to return a motherboard or something, they could charge you like 15% just to take it back. Um, but one other thing we'll talk about here um, as kind of an honorable mention is RAM slots. Now we're talking about hardware and optimizations. A lot of times people will buy excellent RAM, good motherboard, good CPU, and then they don't investigate the proper RAM slots to put your RAM uh, sticks in. Now this only applies if you're not filling all of the RAM slots. If you're filling all of them, it doesn't matter. It will automatically default to dual channel or quad channel or whatever it may be based on the platform. But I see too many times pictures of, that people will share with me of their system and the RAM slots are in the incorrect RAM uh, slots. You, there is a specific order to where the RAM should be based on the channels. And sometimes it might default back to a, 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 dual, a dual channel if you put it in the wrong two slots, but you'll find that it will run at a reduced speed or potentially different timings. And it's, it's really weird. RAM is a, man, that's a whole video subject matter on its own on just optimizing it. So RTFM, or read the fricking manual, 
and look at where it says your RAM should be based on your configuration, how many sticks that you're running. So obviously we could sit here for a solid week telling you things you should and shouldn't do as a new builder. My assignment to you, your homework, since we're back at school now, school's in session, <laughs> comment down below with what your number one thing you should never do to your computer. Now, let's keep it realistic, right? Yeah, you shouldn't set it on fire. You shouldn't drag it behind your car. You shouldn't drop it from the second story. Real things that people can actually learn from. And then don't bother putting on there anything about the AIO locations because <laughs> Steve's video covered all that. Most people didn't bother to watch the whole thing and it's nothing but misinformation alley now. Just put your tubes where they go. All right guys, thanks for watching. Put yep. your tubes to our subscribe button. I'll show you where I'm gonna put my tube. <laughs>